you about debating and developing democracy in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you. Um, F5. All right. Um, but before that, just a brief context about the political culture in the Philippines. So we see how everything fits. Um, it's an awesome country. I'm glad you all are here, but I'll have to be a bit more critical um, in terms of this presentation. So it's still a fledgling democracy, which means some of the political institutions are quite weak. Uh, there are very strong religious influences. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines is a key shaper of public policy, which is why women's rights are not as realized as they can be. Um, it's also, there's also very, like in terms of culture, there's a, at the risk of sounding essentialist, of course, there are many exceptions. Metro Manila is a lot, a, this is less true for Metro Manila as for other places, but there's a strong emphasis on seniority and hierarchy and smooth interpersonal relations, sometimes at the expense of rational discussion or like constructive professional criticism, people take it personally when people disagree. Um, Often people beat around the bush or euphemize, like frank, straightforward disagreement is often frowned upon. There's a lot of patronage politics, there are heaps of political, there, there's political dynasties, the norm. Um, also, Manny Pacquiao is a congressman, which means like, our electoral process is a bit problematic. There's a lot of showbiz and politics mixing. Um, so that's the political culture, and it's, it's maturing, but those are some problems that are still quite pervasive in some regions more than others. Um, the dominant critique of university students in the Philippines is that we're fairly, in, they, I'm done with university, um, they are fairly insulated from civil society, and they often are, especially the private universities, are members of the middle and upper, class, upper classes. And in terms of the educational system, a lot of it is very theoretical or abstract, more than practical or socially informed. The educational system is also very parochial, like even here. Um, sometimes the teachers don't read the newspapers, so students aren't really aware of what's happening outside the country. I mean, you're lucky if they know what's going on in their own country, because a lot of it is very um, theoretical. Uh, and even the debate culture currently is still geared more towards competitive debating, and it generally involves more elite students, by elite I mean their class position. Um, these people have more access to better English training, which still is true in this country. Even if um, we have English as one of our, our official languages, that's really fake. Um, it's not the case, actually. Um, people with more access to private universities, access to the internet, and all of these things. So it's still a little more competitive and um, a little more class. Um, but there are trends towards debate organizations and debaters engaging in advocacy and collaboration with civil society groups. Usually these setups are quite ad hoc or semi-informal. It's just a beginning trend. So what I'll do today is present you with a picture of what's been going on, what dimensions debate orgs have started to engage in, I mean in terms of civil society, and, and talk about potential spaces for improvement. All right, so they've been involved in generating political awareness, political advocacy and lobbying, and further debate education. In terms of generating uh, political awareness, debate orgs have began to conduct on-campus lecture series. A big problem is apathy among the student populations themselves. As I said, um, they're usually members of the middle or upper classes. Uh, a lot, some of these, or, or like during tournaments that they host, they started inserting issue forums requiring all participants to attend them, to participate in them, to engage the speakers, to react to the speakers. Um, and they started holding public debates, like maybe in the last like seven to ten years. Um, some examples would be the Ateneo Debate Society, for example, holding a lecture series on lecture series on the following topics, like labor migration of medical professionals, that's a really, really important issue uh, pertaining to the Philippines, um, the reproductive health bill, I'll talk about that in detail later, freedom of information bill, which we still do not have, even if we are a democracy, uh, federalism policy, because there are um, suggestions to turn the Philippines into a federal state because of um, the demographic in certain places in Mindanao. Um, the University of the Philippines Debate Society has held issue forums on the Bansamoro struggle. 
So it's not really a secessionist movement per se, but there's an ideological like difference that exists between some uh, Muslim organizations in Mindanao and the government of the Republic of the Philippines. Comprehensive agrarian reform policy land reform is a problem here, and senatorial elections. Common institutional partners we've had for these activities include the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, which is a German Christian Democrat foundation. They are also very rich. Um, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, which is the most popular broadsheet here. Akbayan Youth, which is a socialist democrat party, like uh, some debaters are actually like members of that party. Uh, the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, in 2006 to 2008, Ateneo Debate Society was affiliated with Pinoy Bantay Bayan. Bantay Bayan means um, serve as a... Yeah, something like watch the country, but that's, that's a, a lot of things get lost in translation. Um, so it's a loose coalition of academics, business leaders, students and activists. They served as electoral watchdogs, and they were scrutinizing the election candidates. This was during the election, the election of Lorena Capagal Arroyo um, that, that season, where we obviously expected grand bank cheating. I probably still haven't, but like that was in response to that. So debate societies also joined um, initiatives like that. And next slide. All right, so that's public awareness. In terms of, well, obviously these categories are not neat distinctions, right? They overlap, they're mutually constitutive and everything. Um, political advocacy and lobby. So a big, big issue in the Philippines right now is the passage or the campaign for the Reproductive Health Bill, which is meant to guarantee access to, cheaper access to contraception, especially to poorer communities and sex education. Schools, like, unfortunately, we do not have an aiding laws for those things. Um, the church is blocking it. Ateneo is, this radio institution is agnostic when it comes to that because it's a Catholic institution. So a lot of private universities themselves, um, who are among the best universities in the country, like Ateneo, the University of Santa Tomas, or even De La Salle, the university leaders themselves cannot speak out because the priests still report to um, the church, right? So debate societies and even student councils, but more importantly, actually debate societies, have been at the forefront of these campaigns, especially among the student demographic. Um, they've been involved in mass demonstrations outside the House of Representatives. Some of the air debaters participated in a, a, just a recent, like, show of force outside the Ateneo uh, campus where they rallied and then in the vernacular called on uh, commuters to hawk their vehicles uh, if they were in support of their productive health bill and there were a lot of honking vehicles so it was really really noisy. Basically noise was meant to you know signal support. Um, uh, what else? Social media campaigns and targeted high profile challenges towards conservative politicians. So this is a uh, really interesting story, and I'll show you later a newspaper clip. It got a lot of press. In fact, this politician dude ended up calling one of our representatives to ask us to please back down because there was too much media beat on him. Um, so in the Senate, there were debates on the reproductive health bill, and this politician just flat out questioned all the UN statistics on maternal mortality and things like that, and he said he didn't think it was true in a particularly disrespectful and stupid way. So what happened was the big societies around the country, including like Akbaya and the party organization that is one of our loose partners, led by the Ateneo Debate Society, publicly called on this politician to debate the top debaters of the country on that topic and defend his view that um, in fact, maternal mortality is not an issue and that we shouldn't have an orange bill. Like, they just kept publicly calling for this and it was picked up by radio stations and media stations. It's on the news for at least like two weeks. Of course, the dude backed down and said there was no point in debating because um, he couldn't change his mind anyway. But we, we made clear, and this message did get out, that it was about people whose minds were made up yet and not about him per se. Um, I'll show you that clip in a while. We also were involved in lobbying for the Freedom to Information Bill. I mean, and this, I, I, this um, issue was, like, I suppose, more relevant to debaters because, like, we need information to be able to debate properly, right? So that's where it ties in. Um, and we coordinated with the Philippine Transparency Network. At the debate society, when I was in college, co wrote uh, the position paper that they now use when they lobby for the Freedom to Information Bill. Unfortunately, I think this just got asked. Um, 
And during the corruption scandals of the previous pre fake president, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, um, debate societies of top schools in Manila were among the first to denounce corruption in the regime, like the Far Eastern University Debate Club um, Society, uh, went to rallies outside the Supreme Court during the midnight appointment scandals where towards the end of her term she appointed like Supreme Court people <laughs> to ensure that she wouldn't be held accountable after her term. Uh, state universi uh, universities like for example Ateneo were slow to react because a lot of the business leaders who are alumni of the, orga of the school were also um, involved in the Arroyo administration. It's a small country which means that top universities are actually invested in the ruling elite, which means debate societies are actually real bastions of dissent and sometimes get censored by their school administrations as well. Um, in the state universities, uh, debate societies are also involved in uh, lobbying their school administrations, like the two issues that were quite uh, common in the interviews I conducted were questions on funding, especially for liberal arts programs, and contesting and challenging the large class policy because state universities are having larger and larger classes uh, um, which are of course really ineffective especially for the social sciences so the University of the Philippines Los Banos debate society in particular is very actively involved in this all right so that's a new scheme you'll see Joe's name there for example that's an example of one of many 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 um, newspaper critiques he was superly humiliated when he turned down the challenge, and I don't think he will ever be re-elected again. Because he's a two-termer already, right? Okay, next. I think we're done. Ah, okay. And the last thing we do, I mean, another thing we do is debate education. So, um, at the end of the line, University of the Philippines, Diliman in particular, although a lot of schools as well, I think Gian, Gian might talk about this, say the university in uh, Cagayan or in Southern Philippines, have extensive debate education programs. Um, we target high schools and colleges outside Metro Manila. Our reach has extended to over 20 cities or provinces um, outside Manila. This program has been ongoing for over 10 years now. It's been awarded by the World Bank, actually. It's also been awarded by the Office of the President of the Philippines when it actually meant something. Um, so what does the debate education program do? We help start debate clubs, provide information and training on how to sustain debate clubs to uh, schools that don't have debate clubs who want to have them, um, direct them to competitions that they can join, direct them to future trainings that they can join, um, distribute debate training materials and resources and current issue, events, controversial issues. Trainings are for free. We try to make sure that the, we train the trainers as well so the model is replicable. As if possible, we come back to the same area at least once every year in the first five years. Um, but this has suffered budget cuts lately. Okay, what are the next steps I would suggest? I think um, it might be key to formalize partnerships with progressive civil society groups. Like these partnerships are there, but they're quite loose and diffuse. So maybe we can formalize them. Uh, I would also suggest a more active presence in media programs. Like debaters have a lot of media knowledge, especially in the last four years, because media programs are key, key to have like a youth representative. Whether this is token or not doesn't matter, because usually the debater in the program outshines all the other guests and has more sensible things to say, which leads them to invite debaters again after, and it snowballs. So I would recommend a more active presence in media programs, TV and radio. Um, PR officers in debate courts can easily do this. In fact, if you ring the media, the programs themselves, they're, they may be happy to have debaters on board for some of their shows. So it's really sometimes just a question of initiative or reaching out to them. And that's a really, really good platform. Like members of the FN and debate society, sometimes like we get recognized when we're walking around in public and people go, oh, we saw you in this show. We really like what you said. Um, I, I, I thought about it some more, especially the alumni base of Ateneo, which is quite conservative. Um, more public debates, definitely, because the student body seems to be interested in this. Like attendance rates are usually quite high. Um, I would also suggest debates in the vernacular, because like I said, English language proficiency is not very high in this country, and it's very stratified. Um, with mixed teams, so student debaters, I suggest team up with local politicians, teachers, whatever. Doesn't just have to be students. Um, it can be a real community thing. Um, and of course, improve the use of social media for campaigns. So some campaigns have been using that quite that quite effectively. Yeah, that's it.
Can you repeat the question, Sherwood? What are the most challenging uh, parts of promoting the debate in the Philippines? Um, like, I don't think there are formal barriers. Like, no one is actively prohibiting us from promoting debate. But wait, I mean, it depends on the demographic. Like, if it's outside Metro Manila, then cost is definitely an issue. Because we're going to have to fly to those different places. And some of these debate clubs or schools are like new and cannot afford to fly us in. So if we can afford to fly for free, we normally fly for free. We used to have a budget for that, but I think that's been slashed. So cost definitely outside Metro Manila. Within Metro Manila, some high schools are incredibly conservative. Um, those run by uh, religious institutions. So when we go conduct debate trainings and we try to talk about homosexual rights or women's rights, for example, the debate clubs sometimes get into trouble. We, so what, the approach to this is really just to strike a balance between not openly defying them, but still subtly defying them. The students are happy anyway. Um, so that's the second challenge, religious influence. Um, the third challenge, I would think, is like students themselves not having access to news and current events. Like They look at this not as a as something that students should be doing. Like they look at it as an additional burden to the already heavy school work that they have. And they have to be uh, prodded to re-imagine what it's supposed to be like to be a student and a political citizen. But but yeah, the good ones are the most dominant challenges come to mind. Yeah. 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 Regarding the... Uh, In partnership with other groups, yeah, not on our own. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are a few of us. Um, so we worked, we worked with the student councils around the Philippines, so mostly in Metro Manila, other debate societies as well, and other organizations within the Ateneo. Right, yeah. So the, my question is, you see, with, uh, with Ateneo being a Catholic-based private school, was that an issue? Was there, were there any challenges that the debate society faced? Or... Are they able to act independently of what the... We, we, we were, the administration okayed that particular rally, so it was fine. Um, but other times when the university or the institution comes up, and we I, haven't, guess, I guess you just gave me an example. Now. Yeah, we haven't formally gotten into trouble, because I don't think our university would take that risk with a debate team, because we probably just go for a university, not a school. Like, but there have been instances of some confrontation between the debate team and the university, like when we oppose the dress code policy, for example, or or other things like that. Their reproductive health policy is a little more sensitive. Corruption, not so much, um, but they haven't formally censured us. But you know, like the difficulty to lie, in, for example, some of your members are honor students. Some of your members uh, want to teach here after, so there's subtle pressure, but there hasn't ever been like formal censure. Or like massive confrontation. Just so we can, so yeah. Just a follow-up question. Mm. What about from authorities, from local councils, from local authorities, government? Has there been any, any pressure? No, no. Thankfully, no. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, oh yeah, please use the mic. Basically, when I was asking if there was any trouble from our school administration on account of our involvement in rallies and protests, and second, if um. We, have, we ran into trouble with local authorities, like local councils, the police, whatever. Nothing, thankfully. I mean, generally, protest is still freer in this country relative to other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure to the exact history, but I can give you like a partial account, I guess. Like when the World Universities Debate Championship started, I think there were eight founding countries. Logan, eight helped. Um, like that, yeah. yeah, so them. And then, you know, some Filipino people, like Ian, PJ, I'm not really sure, 
came over and were like, hey, let's start our own debate team too. And then obviously the challenges to a debate team here would be a bit more different in the developing world context because like if you are among the few people who are actually politically aware, that might move you to be more involved in um, civic engagement activities given the problems outside the university. Um, how we took off, I would probably credit um, Ateneo UP Dinman for a lot of this because these two societies like aggressively promoted debate across the country, like started debate clubs, built up trainers, befriended these people, and like, you know, they're still lifelong friends until now, so they're informal forms of communication throughout the year, provided them assistance and they support. And now, like, I would say we probably have over 50, 60 active debate clubs around the country with both Visayas and Mindanao, because there are three large island groupings, um, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, all actively represented. I don't think they did. I think the universities were actually quite friendly. Although part of this has something to do, perhaps, with the success of debate societies. Like with Ateneo, for the longest time, until recently, we always won the Asian Championship, so that was very easy to market to the university. Like, if this is one of your most successful recruitment tools, because a lot of high school kids come to Ateneo because of the debate team, then they give us a little more flexibility. Same thing with UP Dilaman, because they're fairly successful. And the model has been replicated. Like, Sapir University is among the most successful debate teams in the country now. Definitely the most successful in Southern Philippines. So I can imagine that gives them a lot of leverage with their administration in their um, case. Yeah. So we just had to keep winning to keep our equity so they couldn't kick us around. <laughs> yeah. What seem to be the most um, common or the most favorite topics that the young people want to discuss and debate about? Oh, there are very heaps. Like, I don't know where to start. But, but um, Filipino kids. Um, Filipino. Uh, like, are you asking about local right. issues? Right. Because international issues, there's like Euro, which is about to collapse and things like that. So, like, local issues would be uh, the morals of struggle in Mindanao, um, political dynasties, which are a huge issue here as well. Uh, mining and natural resource extraction, indigenous people, um, corruption, although that's not so much a dichotomy really as just a bad thing. Um, so yeah, generally that. So a lot more political stuff yeah. rather than social issues. There are some social issues, but like, yeah, generally more political things. The social stuff would probably be how indigenous people are treated. Language is also a big issue that comes up in the days because like we have many, many dialects and yet Filipino is being aggressively promoted throughout the country. So that's also a huge topic to be like what that what we what I mean officially English is the main language of instruction, but that's not really practiced in all universities across the country. So that's also a hot debate topic. Um, the role of the church in politics of course, land reform, those things. Labor rights, yeah. Else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when debate societies decide to engage conservative politicians yeah. to debate with them in public, like what is their objective? What is the objective of, of engaging them in public? Okay, I think there are many levels here. Uh, I'm too sorry, something like one is just to inform the voters. Because these politicians are quite widely, like they style themselves as pro family. Right? Like to protect the Filipino family and run on that platform. But their logic of protecting the family is deny people access to reproductive health because all sex is for procreation. So many, many kids good because big family, basically that. So to expose these, um, I mean, expose the flaws in their position is one, to a huge block of undecided voters. Like obviously it's going to be very high profile, right? So we expect a lot of people to tune in, including people who haven't made up their mind. Although for the reproductive health bill, majority of the population actually supports it. Um, so that's one, target the undecided people. Um, next, strengthen the position of the people who are decided. I mean, I think it still energizes the base when you see student debaters kicking the ass of this, kicking the ass of these annoying politicians. Third, possibly just to shame them to their own constituencies 
to say, are you guys seriously supporting this? To our own administration as well, to say, are your, is your moral position seriously consistent with this? And the Lord's like, it, it's more like here, of course. But I would say the primary aim is to target the undecided voters. There's a lot of politics of shaming going on as well. Um, yeah, also because our politicians are very averse to debating. Like, a lot of them rely on celebrities to endorse them, or their media careers, or their own showbiz careers um, as a job start to enter into politics. So we're also trying to change that by trying to prime this whole idea of debating as important in the political discourse. So we actually had a forum for senatorables in 2007, I think, um, where several of the candidates for the Senate showed up, um, and some of them were extremely conservative, but then they were talking about uh, efficiency and economic progress and stuff. And people in the audience asked them scathing questions and they couldn't defend their position in the forum. Like, I think, on the one hand, I'm worried that it might scare away other politicians, but on the other hand, if other politicians come on board and we get their buy-in, it gets harder and harder for the rest to keep ignoring it. So we just keep pestering them and going, we want to debate with you. And we and we get picks up on it as well. Um, I have a question. Right, cool. So, 